Thank you, Fran, and good evening. It's an absolute pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Nancy Parizo. She's a professor emerita of uh, Native American Studies and Anthropology at the University of Arizona and curator of ethnology at Arizona State Museum. She has been an amazing, prolific scholar examining a range of topics relating to things like Southwest indigenous communities, history of anthropology, museum practice, and continues her amazing output even in retirement. One of the areas that, is, that she's probably the leading expert in is women in science in the Southwest. There have been a lot of women, people like uh, Bertha Dutton, Hattie Cosgroves, Matilda Cox Stevens, Elsie Clues Parsons that perhaps haven't gotten the attention that they deserve. And uh, Nancy has spent uh, quite a bit of time trying to bring their contributions to a wider audience. Out of that or tangential to that interest, she has been concerned or very interested in uh, husband and wife teams, research collaborators. My wife and I obviously take that great to heart since we both are anthropologists and Nancy and her husband uh, are both anthropologists as are many people in our generation and younger generations. What we often don't know is and realize is these husband and wife uh, collaborative research teams really stretch back to the beginning of Southwest anthropology and Southwest archeology. span And as an expression of that is her most recent book, A Marriage Out West, which is I think the foundation of her talk tonight. And so we're looking forward to uh, Nancy's talk. And so let me welcome Nancy. Thank you. Good evening. It's been a while since I've given an Ark and His talk. The first one I gave was in 1979, if you can believe it. And um, uh, tonight I want to talk with you about something I've been working on since 1983, um, which is a long time, which is about all the scholars that have been, that we don't know about who've worked in the Southwest. What I'm gonna tell you about tonight is some work that I've done in the past and also what I've done with a lot of help from my colleagues. What we're doing, we may be talking about husband and wife teams. This is friendship teams as well um, in terms of what we're doing. Um, my biggest collaborators are of course, Don and Kay Fowler who I've worked with for, I don't know how many years uh, in terms of what we've been doing, too long to train. But I've also convinced a lot of people that to learn about the hist history of archeology span in the Southwest is gonna take a lot of us doing a lot of work. I, start, I wanna also tonight dedicate this talk and the work we've been doing to our friend, Linda Cordell. Um, the newest book on the history of archaeology that's come out is a Feshrit, and a look at um, uh, the life of Linda Cordell that Maxine McGrin and Deborah Huntley have, have done. Uh, Kay and I have an article on the early women anthropologists in it, but I hope you all can um, look for this book because it's quite wonderful. Now the talk I'm going to give and when I became a historian of anthropology started in 1983. My, I just finished my dissertation and come back from the Smithsonian and my friend Barbara Babcock and I were sitting one day talking about uh, and we asked ourselves whose research in the Southwest was important for the research we both did. Barbara mentioned it was Elsie Clues Parsons for her research up on uh, with Pueblo uh, potters. And I said it was Gladys Riker for the work I was doing with Navajo artists. We also thought about it and thought about had, what did we know about um, uh, Parsons and Rikers. And we thought about how many other women were out, were out there and, and who did we talk about. We started looking in <clears throat> history books and we found out there were lots of famous men that we all knew about, what we had learned in graduate school, who got talked about. But we, and we also found that before uh, 1983, there were several very good biographies out there. Um, but we were also found as we started looking <clears throat> and talking to people like Cynthia Owen Williams that 
women were not in the history of anthropology books and they were not in the histories of Southwestern ar archeology span with a couple exceptions. And those were Ruth Benedict and Elsie Clues Parsons. Um, women were also mentioned more often as linguists, ethnographers, folklorists, and also funding sponsors, but they weren't mentioned very often in terms of physical anthropology or archaeology. We started looking at all the reasons <clears throat> that the women were gone, and it also happened to do that the people, the men who were mentioned in these books tended to be those who taught at Research One universities and had graduate students. They were also the men who had um, taught the theory classes and were also on dissertation committees because their students wrote about them. There were also problems we found out with authorship conventions and also getting employment. So it was a system where most people weren't being talked about. If women were included, they were talked about as data gatherers or the fictive daughters of Franz Boas. Um, and they were also talked about as ethnographers. So we started asking more interesting questions. The other thing we noticed from our works were that Native Americans who did an awful lot of the digging in the Southwest were missing and they still are missing. And this is one of the things I'd like to call for for our young scholars to start looking at because we can't know about the history of anthropology and archeology span in the Southwest if we don't know about the men who were teaching the young people how to dig. Now, one of the things we saw and for special interest in archeology, span which I was interested in much more than Barbara, was what happens when you have special issues that are for a team effort for uh, production of knowledge and also about being able to access digging because it turned out having recognition and, and getting uh, books published had to do with partly your access to field schools and also field compositions. Also the hierarchical structure was turning up. Um, at the early times, women were, were seen not to be able to be good crew chiefs because men were saying that there, it would upset the young males and therefore because they didn't wouldn't like to be told anything by a woman. So a lot of the things that we discussed and found when we did interviews had to do with preconceptions and myths about men and women and also their mental and physical capabilities. Um, you can talk with our friends today, and some of these are still challenges that you would get, but a lot of it is the nature of the work itself. Archaeology, more than ethnology, or ethnology like I do, requires careers with access and to work on more than one project. This can be especially hard for uh, women earlier on and for couples today um, who during the periods when they have young children. Um, and it also, if you have employment problems, that can be hard to uh, maintain a, a professional identity. Today, one of the problems, of course, which we won't see in the early 1900s, is that marriage, if you're going to be married and be these team workers and have independent careers but come together, um, requires positions, hopefully, in the same town. So it's, it's going to take changes in the nepotism rules to change some of that. Now, one of the things that I was interested in for me when I do a study like this and started is I want to know who were the participants, who were the people um, that were the archaeologists. And then if we wanted to do a project that honors them, which we, which we did, and I'll tell you about in a minute, um, who, should, who should be honored? So what I did for a year is looking and we used the greater Southwest and I made little 
file cards, believe it or not, of any time I found a publication by a man or a woman that dealt with anything on Southwest and dealing with Native Americans. Um, I also, I systematically looked through everything. At the same time I was doing this, I had an NEH grant to put together a bibliography of everything that had been written on Southwestern material culture. So I did a two for one project. Um, I came up with the names of published individuals between 1870 and 1945, 3,500 men and 1,600 women. I now had my universe, my population, and I also had a problem. I couldn't put together an exhibit on that many people. So what I did was what I always did. I went to see my friend Watson Smith. Every time when I was in graduate school <clears throat> and up until his death, when I came up with a new project, I'd go and see Watson. And I would sit with Watson like I would do with um, Ray Thompson a lot of time and a lot of other people. But I would tell Watson what I was working on. And what he would do for me is he'd turn around and say, after I talked and rambled for an hour, he'd say in one sentence, oh, this is what you want to learn. So on this time, he didn't do it in one sentence, but he said, let me think a couple days. And we got together again. He had a 20 page single space list of women he knew of who had published in archeology. span Here's a list of what he said were the important people and we should make sure to cover them in our exhibits and in our oral history project. And the, uh, we, we did everyone basically, except for Jean Pinkley. I just couldn't find enough information on her at the time. Watson also thought about of why we should remember <clears throat> an important woman ar archeologist. And also I think this is a good list for men as well too. There's definite personality, he said, to our Southwestern archeologists. There are people who are courageous. They have great force. They have perseverance. They are smart. They can make intellectual contributions. They also know how to look at detail. They have integrity. He called it grit. Um, and I can think of several of these women who had a lot of grit. They were tenacious and they had self-assurance. They also had the ability to be a lone wolf and to succeed and to know that they would probably have problems around the way, but to be an archeologist was important enough that they would do it. And it was also the quality and the quantity of their work was important. And they had to make intellectual contributions to knowledge. It wasn't simply somebody coming out for a, a little vacation and telling you how they got to the Southwest and what they did and they, they met an Indian and they went home. That wasn't part of it. They had to be a scholar and they had to be a data collector. You have to see their names in museum collections today. Another thing was always to include the people who broke barriers and also to include the people who organized and had administrative skills because they were often uh, not recognized. But most important, he said, is they had to have good excavation. We didn't talk about survey at the time and I wish I had, had thought about it, but we talked about excavating. And if you think about it, Watson did more excavating than he did surveys. So the other thing, then we made a list. So I knew that I could answer the first research question. There were women working in the field, but there were also some I soon realized that I had missed. I had missed by focusing on, on publications, the women who helped their husbands have a career by doing archeological work but not having their names on the publication because of what was going on in the time period. One of them was uh, Fuchs's wife and all the repairs she did. Uh, uh, and there you can see her here uh, on Square Tower. 
and all the work that these people did. This was harder to get to than it was for some of the people who were publishing. So what we did is we picked a lot of people and we had in 1985 um, a program called Daughters of the Desert. And this was funded by the Wenigren Foundation. And we brought, it was an, uh, we had a public honoring session and we wanted to honor all the people who are in the Southwest. So they're one of our favorite people, Bertha Dutton doing Being Bertha. Um, we, we, we had um, Catherine Halpern Spencer, who worked in my area. Um, one of my favorite people I met, who and I'd never met before, was Dorothy Kerr, Florence Holly Ellis, and, and these are all in the book, Daughters of the Desert. Our exhibit stayed up for a year, and then the Smithsonian took it, and we, it went around for five years around the country, and it was marketed as one of the first inspirations for STEM science. And one of the best days of my life was when I was at the University of New Mexico giving um, talks. And this, old, this older woman in her 50s came up to me, grabbed my hand, pulled me over to Mary Shepherdson's and said, she got her PhD when she's 60. I'm going to go do it. And she now has her PhD. We also did um, scholarly conferences. Um, and out of that have come two complete volumes, one Hidden Scholar in 93 and another one that I did with a friend, Shirley Leckie, that compares anthropologists to historians. This one is considered comparing to the sciences and within the field. One of the things we did at the conference and we did through interviewing women like our friend Nat Woodbury is we talked about the issues and barriers that they saw and they everybody said the lack of, of uh, salaries and we were doing people who started before World War II remember and the lack of backing. The another one was the intentional exclusion of women from field sites and the idea that every single one of the women we interviewed said that they were told that they were going to entice young men. The problem was women enticing men, not that the young men liked women. Okay, so you can see the reasoning that helped keep people out of the field. There was also not a lot of recognition that turned up for the types of work they were doing. Um, they were doing what Clark Whistler called his housework. And as Nance said, Whistler said, well, of course, you're just a wife to her one time. Um, and also they were told that women were not physically fit or mentally able to do a lot of it. So a lot of them did um, went where they could. You could see that in the people trying to get into the WPA. The WPA would not let women work in the field. They had to work in the lab and paid half as much as the men in the field. The other thing that the ones that had where the teamwork said was nepotism and nepotism that hit especially um, our, be, around World War II and kicking the women out of the positions and getting and, and them losing um, their academic funding because of the GI Bill. Now, we also learned, and this is um, Anne, Anne Morris showing that she does know how to get down and dirty um, or up and over, as we say. Um, they just sent all these women just went ahead and did it given the constraints of their time. One of the things they did is they slowly got obtained excavation and survey permits. They also um, started running their own ex excavations, as we'll see, in obtaining funding. The other thing that they did was that some of a lot of the men didn't do was they popularized. And they also specialized in ways that um, some of the men weren't doing, especially pottery analysis, we found out. They also worked in new, in new areas on the margins of the culture area, which is, where, as we all know now, is where a lot of the action is. They also did not mind getting, getting dirty in terms of that. So when I approached this, 
my interests have been in this and a little bit different than people who do intellectual histories to see what was written and what idea necessarily looked at it. I'm interested in anthropology science as forms of work and how the social aspects of how work and anthropology as a profession in science and academia affects the production and dissemination of knowledge. Um, I'm interested in uh, employment opportunities and barriers, and this comes partly from the time period when we all, uh, our early people in the early 70s, we all graduated. The year I graduated in uh, 1981 had the highest unemployment rate for anthropology since 1932. So I gain important in uh, the barriers and opportunities for employment very quickly from a very practical standpoint. I was also interested and have been in the professionalization of disciplines and how they serve societies, which is one of the things I focused on when I went to the National Science Foundation as a program officer. Now, the approach I take is very much in the sociology of knowledge approach. And that looks at access to resources and what it does to society. Now, I'm also a regionalist. <clears throat> I think the, the greater Southwest is one of the most fascinating areas that have been studied. And one of the reasons I was interested in is that I started noticing with the interviews and gathering data over years that as the ethnologists and linguists came from the East, and a lot of them did, me included, um, a lot of the successful early archaeologists, after you get that initial period from the 1920s on, came from the West. They grew out of advocational endeavors and recruitment and education and mentoring were very important to all of them. Now, I'm going to give you a little disclaimer. <clears throat> I happen to be an archaeological wife, but I am not a member of a husband and wife team. Um, there are two kinds of um, archaeological wives. There are those who like to play in the dirt and those who do not. Now, Pat and Paul like to play in the dirt, so they work together well in terms of that. I don't. As my friend Kay Fowler and I were talking today, we like to sit under trees and sit and talk to people. So I have my own archaeologist to help keep me straight on this, but I'm not an archaeology right. So <clears throat> I'm interested and started looking at husband and wife teams as a strategy. And this is what is called in academia, a two person single job. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and you can see, and that has to do with the nature of it. I have focused and been most interested in the period from the, when anthropology was a natural history endeavor from the 1880s to 1920s. So today, what I'm gonna talk to you about next is a few people and the kind of things they did and the kind of jobs during this period when there weren't positions independently for uh, um, uh, women archaeologists, unless you were independently wealthy and took yourself off to Egypt or Mesopotamia. And what I'm going to talk about tonight is work that Don and Kay have done, Fowlers have done, I've done, um, and um, uh, all of us have done in terms of different people. Um, the first group is going to be the natural, uh, the women that went with the um, U.S. Geological Natural Historians, the Matilda and Co Cox and James Stevenson, uh, Cosmos Mendeleev. The one I'll talk about the most is Frank and Teresa Russell, with Paul put up our book. Uh, the Wetherill family, and then Lucy Wilson as a transition. <clears throat> we know a lot about the U.S. Geological Survey, and we know a lot about John Wesley Powell. Finding information on his wife, Emma, and his sister, um, <clears throat> his sister, Ellen, who we know went on a few of the ex uh, surveys with them, has been extremely difficult. Now, the government scientific expeditions from the 18th 
1860s to the 1880s. We know that occasionally, not all the time, some of the women would go and take care of the camp or they would come out to, if they were going to be in Utah, stay in one of the cities while the men then went down the Grand Canyon. Another thing that the women did when they were doing this, they were serving as the natural historian collectors. They would get botany, ornithology, excuse me, and zoology specimens. And they would collect the specimens to show the environment that they were going to do. Because the US geological surveys were all interested in, in um, environment and geology is done. Now their work, was never recognized nor acknowledged in reports or by historians and scientists really until around 2001. Um, and it is partly because of the nature of how reports were done and how um, they were to be given uh, credit in, the, in these government reports. Now, um, Emma Dean Powell <clears throat> went, went with, um, Powell to Shiloh when he was in and, and took care of him, as, as Don has written in his books. And she would um, uh, go with him on, on other things. She went with them in the expedition in 1867 that traveled from Denver up, up to Pikes Peak. And she climbed Pikes Peak and then helped with them and camped for several weeks. Um, and then uh, would do things like this. She'd also, for the next few years that I have found about, was very interested in ornithology. And she also did a fair amount of the ethnography that Powell um, worked on too. She would have had access to women, which Powell wouldn't. Her job was also to record a lot of the archeology span sites. Um, Powell's uh, sister, uh, Ellen or Nellie Powell was married to Alman Thompson, who also went on the um, on the trips, and she was an accomplished botanist. You can see her collections are huge, and they're at Harvard, Yale, and the Smithsonian. And um, she was a graduate of Wheaton College, and she also worked with the Southern Paiutes and help commission and collect the artifacts that Powell brought back then for the Smithsonian collections. Um, they helped, she helped run the winter camp from 1871 to 82 on the Green River and in Kanab. And one of her big new things was that she actually wore pants. And this was considered um, something that was very important. Now, one of the people who's been working on some of this lately has been Candace Green getting into it. But we need a lot more information and we need somebody in the history of botany to really start getting into the collections that these two women put together with their specialized knowledge that somebody like me doesn't have. Now, what they did in the 1880s and 90s with the people going around is they were studying and they would assist with studying and archaeology in general, studying uh, arch uh, architectural and looking at sand, and they're looking for and locating um, sites. And that's one of the things that women could have as, as, as much a time in terms of not being said that they can't do it because they can't dig dirt as the men did. There are also a period where people were looking for pottery and treasures and studying the contemporary Pueblos as ancestors. You also have a period here where settlers are hunting and selling relics as part of a mixed economic strategy for that. And as part of a mixed economic strategy, it's of course thought that the women would of course help the men do this. If nothing else, they would take care of the dudes that would come out um, to West. And you can see this and what we've known the most about, of course, is the Wetherills as a family business. And um, <clears throat> Kelly and uh, Hayes Gilpin and Leah McChesney and I have all been working with the Hamburg 
to look at some of the collections by um, one of the early um, art historians that came in the Southwest, whose name was Abby Warburg, and that's in an exhibit up at the um, at the Ethnographic Museum in Hamburg at the moment. And part of what when uh, he is a scholar came, the Wetherills and Mrs. Redwell would take them out and show them where sites were along with some of the brothers and help them and give tours and collecting and selling artifacts. Um, one of them, of course, Marietta Wetherill um, is someone I've been interested in because of her work with Navajo singers. And what often happened was that um, the wife and the family in some of these settler families and especially in local situations would write up a lot of the stories and also write up a fair amount of the working with Native Americans that they did for the, for the time. Now the expectation of course <clears throat> was some of the wives, those wives didn't set out to be archeologists. All some of the women that married the Wetherills did want to be archeologists and have access to, to the sites and marrying into the Wetherill family was a good way to do it. Now, what wife supporting and advancing their husband's career was also something done in this period. And what a lot of the women would do were the type of things that never got acknowledged in publications. So it's harder to find out for them. This would be researching in library books, a lot of the editing, um, typing manuscripts, um, uh, writing up sections of publications even. A lot of them turned into the photographers, which is very interesting too. <clears throat> and obtaining, in terms of ethnographic research, when you're talking with the ancestral, uh, descendants of the ancestral Pueblos, talking to women because that information is not available to men. They were also then said to is um, stand behind the great men tradition, the activities, you know, the one where behind every man is a great woman. And, um, but they were also told that these were a lot of uh, household activities. Now, some of them didn't stand for this. <clears throat> And the person I've always used and one of the people I studied for our first round of Hidden Scholars was James and Matillacock Stevenson. When I studied Stevenson, I didn't realize what she was doing for archeology span at the same time. I thought of her as an ethnologist. And she was and also an example of what happens with a, a teamwork career She's going to marry James partly because he's an explorer scientist and that's what she wants to do. And besides they love each other, but they also wanna do that. It gets her access to the field and what she can do. It's also an example of one of the sad things about um, these early teamwork individuals that the women didn't come into their own and be recognized professionally until they were widows. Um, and this is what happens for um, Matilda Cox Stevenson. She's one of the first people to be hired by the federal government as an anthropologist. Tilly's also has, as, as you probably know, um, dedicated to science. And as she was in, in the newspapers for making sure that everybody did and helped her, helped her husband collect. There's been a wonderful book written about her since um, we did our early research in 2007 by Darlis Miller. And she looks as Darlis Miller is a person who's interested in pioneer women in the Southwest and takes that approach. Um, Tilly also, as I started working on this and noticing, was I think one of the first people to publish a research design. This was in her book. This was the first article written on the 1879 Bureau of American Ethnology a trip that she and her husband went on. And she also then, then writes a book called Zuni and the Zunians, which made Frank Hamilton Cushing very mad because she got the first article out. She also 
then gave a research design of how they, she thought we should start looking at archaeology and ethnology together. And she then devoted lots of her career to working on archaeology. And unfortunately, this is something that's never been written up. Um, she helped to write the first Antiquity Act with Alice Fletcher, which didn't make it. But she also then spent every field trip she went to the Southwest, she spent days looking for sites. Um, around San Alfonso in 1905, up near Taos, um, Zuni sites. Every year she's going out and looking and recording where the Zuni sites are. And then also she was on the first trip the BAE trip into Canyon Nuche in 1882. Unfortunately, her notes were taken by um, John P. Harrington and cut up, and they're really hard to put together. So one of the things that my next book I'm writing on has to do with the 1882 field season which is a looking at a, doing this slightly differently than I've done before by looking at the, the US Geological Survey and the Bureau of American Ethnology Survey, combining archeology, span ethnology, geography, and geology, and looking at them in terms of um, the politics of doing field work with the federal government. If we, this is going to be taking and redoing our, what we've been doing, studying on looking at the US Geological Survey, geology by itself, geography by itself, it's all one thing. And all these people who are in the Bureau were going, and the US Geological Survey under Powell were going back and forth. So here's an example of Cosmos Mendeleev's rock art which um, I'm sure Dennis Gilpin will help me with since I, and Kelly, since they're much good at this. Another reason that I'm really interested in this is that Matilda Cox Stevenson did one of the hallmarks of what uh, uh, women in the husband and wife teams did. They were trained in art and they have made some of the most gorgeous renditions and none of these things have seen the light of day. Matilda Cox Stevenson's from the trip are in the National Archives under the US Geological Survey and nobody's ever used them. <clears throat> Unless a drawer for the BAE or somebody used them as the base. Now, one of the things that did come out of the um, Daughters of the Desert uh, project that we were very happy about was New Mexico made all the people in its state treasures. And they have put up historical markers. This one's, I'm sorry, I'm not a good photographer. Um, about Matilda Cox Stevenson, it's on the, it's near the, uh, on Route 53 over near uh, Rama. And they have put up on, on the people we had in there, what they did. <clears throat> and as part of a historic women's marker initiative and came out in 2006. So we've had some recognition in terms of that. Now, <clears throat> teamwork goes with archeology. span And we of course had the Mindeleff brothers, they were team going in and out working in our, and, and working there. But after Victor left the BAE, um, uh, Cosmos married a woman named Marion Warner, and she went with him when he did all his studies at Casa Grande and up the Verde Wim, oh, uh, River. Um, she said she would stand and, and be the model to give scale. I understand that. Rick would have me hold something in the field, you know, and be the model sometimes. And she would, she came and did helped him do everything and doing the plan for restoring Casa Grande, partly because otherwise she'd be sitting home by herself for six months of the year and that was not a good marriage. 
No, the person that Don and I have done the month most on, um, and as you all know, um, we're all kind of joined at the hips in terms of all the research we do, was to look at an archaeological wife who didn't want to be an archaeology wife. She wanted to be a u university professor. And this was Frank and Teresa um, Russell. Um, Francis Teresa Russell is going to become a professor at Stanford. And Frank Russell um, is known for the Pima Indian book, as, as most of you know. Now, Frank Russell was, they had an archaeological marriage. They were both born in Iowa. <clears throat> and uh, Frank went to the State University of Iowa and got his uh, bachelor's degree and his master's in um, natural history. Um, he was a, he's then going to go on to Harvard and be one of the first few PhDs in Harvard. And he's going to be the first one in the country to specialize in physical anthropology. Unfortunately, he's going to become a professor at Harvard. And, but unfortunately, he's going to get um, sick when he does his research for his dissertation. He's going to get TB. Now, before that, when Frank was in Iowa, he became an Arctic explorer and he made the collections that are at the Iowa State in, at the University Museum in Iowa. And he also published a complete book of his natural history explorations before he even went to, to Harvard. Um, he was interested, as you can see, in positions and clothing. He did public, he, he followed Powell's model of making sure you have popular books out to establish your reputation to explore, then do the scientific publication. He also, when he gets to um, there, starts teaching anthropology, and these are some of his notes that he did when he was there. Now, Frank also decided he was going to do his dissertation on um, body measurements and physical anthropology, comparing what he had found in the West with groups in Labrador. So he joins some expeditions. He goes to Europe, learns anthropometry and the German method, and joins an exhibition. Unfortunately, there he gets tuberculosis, and he gets a very bad case of tuberculosis. He comes back, and he um, finishes his dissertation, and he starts teaching at Harvard. But it's pretty obvious that Frank needs to get out of the industrial, wet, damp Northwest. So what he does is he decides he's been looking at the Trenton grave goods and he has developing whether they were Delaware tribes as their, as their descendants. He decides he wants to look at the, in, the, in, the people in, uh, in Hopi and Zuni, as opposed to the Rio Grande Pueblos, and see were they physically the inhabitant, the, the descendants of the inhabitants of ancestral Pueblo sites. So what he decides to do is to go and gather skeletons and, and skulls from sites in Tucson and to establish a database. He's then going to take all this stuff back to Harvard and study it in the laboratory. And he's going to, and Don's and I book is about partly all the trouble he gets into by doing this because he didn't go and get a permit to do it. He also decides to, to get married. And the person that's going to help him do this is Frances Teresa Peake. Frances is also born in Iowa. She goes to the state university. She's the smart one of the group. We're talking the, the just about the valedictorian of her whole year. She doesn't have any jobs afterwards, even though she's in Phi Beta Kappa. The only jobs open to her were to become a high school teacher and administrator. And this is the same things that were open to uh, um, Frank as well. So what they do is that they decide, and they've been in love for, with each other 
since Francis was in the parade that welcomed uh, Russell back from his, as, a, as a triumphant explorer from the Arctic. Um, Francis decides to go to um, Radcliffe for a year. And this was um, a fascinating time for her. She becomes a basically the prodigy of a man named William James. And William James was one of the probably the beginning of psychology, the foremost philosopher in this country, and he's going to become her mentor. Now, to get ready to go to the Southwest, Frank had gone in uh, 1898 to the Hikaria Reservation to establish a new research area and contain his, his um, tuberculosis. He starts looking for archaeology sites, um, and he starts looking for um, a lot of um, uh, uh, rock art sites. And then the two of them get married. They go back, and it's clear that Frank isn't going to make it. So what they do and what the book's about is a fair amount of it is they have a honeymoon by going and being and doing a what we call a desperation survey to find human remains on the Hopi reservation and everything. They, they, uh, they start out in Ganado, they go up here and how they do it is they go all over the place, back and forth, back and forth, here and there, and here and there. It took us about three years to figure out what their route was. They go all the way down to uh, Winslow and come back up here and then head back and, and do that. In the process, Teresa learns how to be an archeological wife. She shows up in a dress and that she, she comes and she starts out in her wedding dress. And the first day when they're driving to um, Ganado, she's wearing little white gloves. She gradually learns how to not wear white gloves to start acting like um, uh, somebody out west. She'd never been west of uh, eastern Iowa. How to travel, how to wash in an arid environment, how to take photographs and locate sites. But her, to her regret, the one thing any she never did was she was never could make biscuits. And if anybody who has ever um, grew up, did a field school with Amal Howery, one of the tests was whether you could wait, make weather ill stew when biscuits and Teresa would have flunked on that one. But she did learn how to take photographs and she took photographs of uh, and kept notes on the Navajos that were helping. We actually have something on the Native Americans that were on the trip working on it. And they included a Navajo woman near Watavi who decided she wanted to dig with them. And so this is one of the first instances we have of a Navajo woman digging. It's a bad photograph. Um, and she also talks about how they were getting around and the problems of trying to get there. When they were done, they took all their artifacts back to Harvard to theoretically analyze them. Frank gets so sick that they have to leave again. They go down then to the Southwest and they, um, they then do a reconnaissance as the state. And what they were doing is looking at uh, sites all over the place. And they're looking at also doing assessments for pot hunting, which is then gonna go into um, homes uh, to get the antiquity at. After this, they go to Sacatone and become and do the, the projects that we all know about, which is the Pima Indian. And they also, at the same time, start locating and recording sites around Phoenix and on the reservation. Um, when they uh, finish this, they try to go back to Harvard again. It doesn't work. They come up near Williams, get uh, a ranch to try to um, get Frank back to health, but he dies in 1903. This leaves um, uh, uh, Teresa with completing 
the Pima Indian book. She wrote the last couple chapters. She also took all his folklore studies and got them fixed up. She didn't do the um, his archaeological materials. She sent it back to Holmes, excuse me, Hodge and Fuchs, and they split them up between themselves. What she did do is decide that she did not want to be a widow living in Iowa, and she went back to Harvard. She hooks up with, um, uh, with um, James again, and James takes her to um, Stanford University just in time to, in, to be in the San Francisco earthquake. But he is her, his teaching assistant there, and she gets offered a job if she can show that she can be um, a published scholar. And this is going to be in English. So what she does is she takes the Frank's notes and her own journals and does a travelogue of 12 um, stories of how she becomes an archaeologist wife and assistant. And she does this by, it's called In Pursuit of a Graveyard, being an archaeological wedding. And in it, she just shows that she's going to be a scholar and this, you, and she has these philosophical debates with Frank and um, a pseudo humanist, which is really James, about all sorts of philosophies. If you really look, Teresa's a philosopher and the theoretician and, not, and Frank's the empiricist in this marriage. This works, she becomes a well-known expert. She's gonna be one of the first people to, um, uh, to be a, a professor. She, fight, she gets her um, degree in, during, um, she, uh, during World War I. She does field work in Britain and she has a tremendous number uh, of that. Now she's the one that went and used archeology span then and field notes. And those are the only, that's the only thing that's been written. Nobody's ever uh, dealt with all those uh, uh, Frank's field notes into turning it as an opportunity to go into an academic career. In the 1910s and 20s, archeology's span doors going to both open and you're going to get then women starting to manage their own excavations and needing permits. The person that helped break through some of this is Lucy Langdon Wilson, who was one of the first women to, as far as I can see, the first women to direct an entire project. But I'm gonna guess there's local, some of the local archeologists are doing it as well too. She's got a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania, and she's going to do an indigenous-centered archaeological field study. Um, is she, her husband, um, and she's going to make it, is the director of the Philadelphia Commercial uh, Meeting. And she's doing this because she's interested in education, and she wants to learn more things so she can put archaeology into her into her elementary and high school classes. This is the beginning of STEM education and people haven't recognized uh, the amount that archeology span could be used with this. Some of the work she's done, you can see it, and that was over at Otoe. And um, she used the interpretations from her the San Alfonso workers. She also, her husband, um, William Wilson was uh, was uh, assisting her doing things. So it's kind of the inversion of the husband wife team. And this is the wife husband team in terms of doing that. Um, you also see some of the same things helping in that, um, keeping going with husband and wife teams. One of the first things that happens with Ethel Nelson is that she, as far as I can tell, was one of the first paid assistants on one of these. The wife actually getting paid as a separate individual. And that's going to be breaking through uh, uh, too. The Alfred Gate. The Kidders become a continuation of the family work model. So you can see people wanting to keep the family together and having a, a single career when there aren't options because Harvard isn't going to um, help. 
Now, we also know that in the 1920s and 30s, things are going to change a lot. You're going to get a lot of interesting women working on their own, but that's a story for another night. You'll also have a lot of the husband and wife teams continuing, people we all know, and a whole lot more in terms of it, have, having a this is a way that when you're still not getting equal employment opportunities, an economic viable situation to have a household be the unit. Um, as our friend Natalie Woodbury said, being married to an anthropologist, and she married one of the nicest human beings in the whole world, um, meant that she, could, she was not pulled away from what she wanted to do. And that was one of the main reasons that these women wanted to do it. Now, we've got a lot of work to still do on terms of all of this, but we've got a lot of, let me finish with just some of the work that's in the pipeline that you're going to see pretty soon about husband and wife teams and some of the things I think we still need to do. <clears throat> Kit Hensley and David Wilcox, who we know has all just passed away, who, Dave Wilcox has passed away, had been working for years on the, on the Hemingway expedition. Um, Kit has just finished up one of the, the next volume of the Camp Hemingway, where we're gonna learn much more about Emily and Margaret, um, Mag Hill, uh, and I'm looking forward to that coming out a lot. The next book out, and I hope you all will invite her to give a talk next fall, is Shelby Tisbale has, con has finished um, her uh, biography that um, uh, we began whenever we all began. And she has, um, it's gonna be published by the U of A Press. And I think it's in production at the moment. And Marge Lambert, who's up here, was one of the first women to be in charge of a field school at New Mexico Normal University and all our own, and the men did very fine listening to her, and she didn't have any trouble, and she wanted to dig a lot. Now, even today, I found out that in our paper this morning was an article on Irene Vickery, who I never had time to study earlier, and she's another one that should be in our, um, in our um, husband and wife teams. And she represents one of the people that we're the weakest on in terms of our knowledge. And it's the people who worked in their local area and built tremendous amounts of knowledge that then academics would take and combine into their big studies when they're talking about regionalism. Um, she was, there was an article on her in the Arizona Capital Times, but look at the paper this morning, if you are, and find out about, um, Irene and looking at Beshpagola, who then um, uh, Byron Cummings will take down and we're working with, with the Arizona State Museum. Um, there's a lot more to come and a lot more we need to do. And according to Watson Smith, he made me try, he told me I really needed to, that as soon as I got all those 1500 women done, it was time to write about those 3600 men. So I'm gonna ask you all to come help me <clears throat> and help with that because I'm not sure I can do 3,600 men or my husband archeologist wouldn't want that much data in the house again. So I wanna thank you tonight for all and thanks to all these unsung heroes, these men, women and Native Americans who have all worked in the Southwest and who have helped make our knowledge of the place that we all live and whose lands we are residing on, as Mari said, such a wonderful place. So thank you. Thank you so much, Nancy. It's an important history that we have missed for a long time. So um, really appreciate it. I'm waiting for some questions to come in. Um, I did have one during your talk. Do you know what ever happened to that Anne Axtell Morris film that uh, it previewed here in Tucson in April, has sort of disappeared. It's a Hollywood-made film on Ann Morris. I don't, but if, is Kelly here? 
She may know. If someone else out there knows, you're welcome to put uh, a note in the chat and I will share it with others. Um, I haven't followed up on it since that first preview. So I haven't either. Yeah. And Sorry. I'm waiting. Yeah. Any other questions? I don't see any questions yet. Are there any questions out there for Nancy? Mm, I don't see any, but we'll wait a few more minutes. More comments? Who did you know? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, none of my aunts were in there. <laughs> we talked about that earlier. Uh, no, that was, it was really very interesting, I, I thought. And, you know, we all know that life has changed, but it's mm -hmm. good for us to have the details of what happened before because we didn't know a lot of those. We knew they were there, right? We didn't know how much of the work was really being done by the women. So, yeah. Go ahead. Did you have something? That's partly what's changed in science too. If you look at the um, authorships in Science Magazine and the Hard Sciences and Medicine, the list of authors is now five lines long. Mm -hmm. More inclusiveness of recognizing the different types of work than there used to be. Right, right. And it's obvious from our students too that you know there are many more women in the field now that definitely that weren't there before. Let's see what I have here. Um, do you think there'll be better institutional recognition of dual career couples? Institutions after they took some of the nepotism laws off have used <clears throat> dual as a way to um, employ cheaply husband and wife teams because they want to stay. The University of Arizona did that for a long time, partly because the mentality was that it was a place that everybody would want to be. Um, what would happen is that it really takes um, the first person who gets the job uh, tends to get more recognition than the second person at the moment. And this is what is a phenomena in academia that's called the trailing spouse. And it's not fair. And what it's going to do, it's going to take changes in the way faculty are paid and recognized, and also a change that you can have, uh, what a change you're seeing now um, in terms of the hierarchical structure. But it's going to be a while because academia is so hierarchically organized that you could see even that if one person gets into administration, then it can bring the other one. But there is still the mentality that um, to have uh, to have two people who are equally credentialed very good. And the idea that you want one of them for a job that's been advertised. Then part of the condition is they have a spouse who also has a PhD is as well qualified. That person has to usually at places in research one universities come in and on soft money. And so then the um, until that changes in hard monies and the way um, positions are assigned within colleges um, get up, it's going to take a while. Um, the easiest way to do and to get things to change is for something spectacular to happen to the, tr the trailing spouse, like they get a MacArthur. Um, I've seen then, I've seen people become, uh, become better. It also has to do with the nature of how favors are done in a university. The ones who make, who seem to at the moment have the best chance of equally having respect is how much each of the members bring in in terms of research fund and overhead. I hate to say it but it has to do about the faculty members and the spouses bringing in resources to the university to show their worth. It's getting more and more like a model that you see in medical schools where people have to either 
um, they either teach three classes or they go and be a physician and see patients to bring in as well as the research money. And you can see this happening across the country in terms of this. So um, I'm until the economic structure of academia changes and who gets recognized, it's going to be a problem unless the first of, of the pair, if the first person has a has um, um, can get into powerful positions, it's still going to be hard. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I just don't see academia changing that much. Yeah, yeah. it would be interesting to see what those changes have been, like how many women are hired first because of what they do, or how many couples are working on the same types of projects or different projects. Well, because, it tends to be yeah. whoever finished first yeah. has the easier time. Yeah. Okay, it isn't the male versus the female anymore. It's whoever finishes the degree first, by and large. Mm -hmm. And then the luck of who's retiring and what direction the university want to go in terms of strategic planning. So, um, so it has to do a bit with that. Mm -hmm. uh, someone's asking, um, can we make the list of books that you mentioned available? And I, I do create a a uh, follow-up letter through Zoom. Is there a way I can get a list of those books that I could add into there? Yeah, if you give me a couple of days, I'll put it together. Okay, okay, okay. Um, well, I will go ahead and um, send out one. I'll send out the follow-up email to this lecture with the video on it and all, and then I'll send another one if you send me that okay, list at some you. point. That would be good. Yes. All right. Um, I think that's it. Um, the other question was, you kind of, you have been answering, I think, the changes in husband and wife teams compared to the past. And I think we've talked about that. Do you have anything else to add to that? I don't know. Does anybody else who's a, currently a husband and wife team want to do it? I remember I have a disclaimer. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if anybody else has it, you're welcome to put something in the chat or I can even give you access to speak uh, if you'd like. Um, let's see. Yeah, so Shelby Tisdale put a note to us and to you. Thank you, Nancy, for the contributions you've made in recognizing the important roles women have played in the history of Southwest anthropology and archaeology, especially the husband well, and wife teams. The same to you, Shelby. Yeah, and thanks for mentioning her book, because that is yes. coming out soon through Arizona Press. So that's great. All right, it looks like we don't have any other questions. I just wanna say thank you so much, Nancy, for taking the time to do this with us this evening. We really, really appreciate it. And those of you out there, thanks for being here and we will see you again next month, hopefully for the next lecture. Thank you and have a good evening.